little picture. Yeah. Um, All right, we're live. We're joined this hour by Douglas Jacobs, who is a, a playwright, an actor, a uh, producer, a director. Uh, he's been at the the you know at the ground floor, the the breaking, you know, the the, the champagne bottle, the breaking the champagne bottles on many a voyage. Um, very very excited to have you here. <laughs> huh? No, no, no. I was just uh, smiling. The champagne bottle. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Breaking the champagne bottle. I was laughing at that. Cutting the ribbon, sticking the shovel in the ground. Um, yeah, he's at he's at the ground floor. <laughs> it's been a many a ground floor, and so we're very very excited to have you here, Doug. Um, but before we get started, can you tell us how did you get how, how did your life in the theater begin? How did you get involved in theater? Uh, well, it's a long story. I think I can make it short, and I may have mentioned it the other day. I mean, when I was born, my mother was at a movie, working in a movie theater, and uh, she'd been a straight A pre med student, but she quit school to put my dad through law school, which women did in the 1940s. Uh, but it was sort of her plan as well. But so the movie theaters were kind of my babysitter. But then I really got to be a good reader, and then I was into science and math, and I did church plays, but I wasn't a theater person. And then as a freshman, I had an incredible class by a guy who was teaching four books of Camus, uh, six modern plays, like six characters in search of an author, Ibsen, Strindberg, Albi, Brecht. Uh, I saw Murat Saad, wrote a paper on Murat Saad, and uh, fell in love with an actress and uh, started taking acting classes my freshman year. And so a lot of it, a lot of my life seemed to be spring 1988, the year when the world was exploding. Mm. And, uh, and I was just after the spring break, I was rowing crew, but I was also uh, taking my first acting class in the, in the spring semester quarter out of curiosity. I was amazed they taught acting at a college level, so I took it out of curiosity. And uh, I was really sort of didn't know that people wrote plays like the modern playwrights, like Pirandello, Ionesco, Breck, all of those people. I had no idea those plays exist. understand until I was much older. But um, that spring break, I actually went to the Carmen's and did a workshop with Joan Baez on nonviolence, which also got me into Gandhi's work. And, and right after spring break, I probably saw Buckminster Fuller speak. And then I was also taking acting classes and got cast in a play playing an old clown on a J.M. Barry play, the guy who wrote Peter Pan, it was a play called Pantaloon. And so I got sort of, but I was studying political geography, which I did for about two years. So I was studying politics and sociology and anthropology and economics, two, two quarters of, you know, hardcore economics and, and different things. And the theater kept grabbing me. And by my junior year, I declared it as my major. And I was doing a lot of acting but we it was a big literature program we read a huge amount of literature dramatic literature and other literature and then so i sort of moved out of science and math and surprised a lot of people because uh but the political geography had a huge impact on me in terms of running a theater later and getting to know a city and uh and the nature of it and uh and then I went to Cal Arts, which was totally insane. It was so insane. It was like I was ready to go back and be, go to law school like my father. And then a very interesting final quarter, and I ended up staying in theater. And then a year or two later, going to San Diego to start the San Diego Repertory Theater. And by that time, by the end of my graduate school, I was sucked into it. Theater was sort of my life. Yeah. Uh, also and the film school, I was studying theater there, but Alex Alexander McKendrick would pull theater students into the film uh, classes because he liked mixing theater people and film people. Yeah. So tell us. And his, his teaching was amazing. So tell us about uh, Alexander McKendrick and, and, and some of the films he did. Yeah. Can you tell us about Alexander McKendrick? Well, he did uh, a lot of the Ealing. Yeah, I got it. Uh, 
seems to be a little delay, but I got it. It's uh, He was a commercial artist initially. He worked for J. Walter Thompson in London, one of the big, but he was in the military and he was in Italy and he'd already done some theater. And uh, he had a lot to do with, as I mentioned, freeing up the camera equipment so that the he would shoot in the streets because the film studios were still war storage. But he was a very interesting figure. Even though he came out of a commercial art background, he could teach Aristotle, Freud, Jung, kind of like you, he was interested in everything. You know, he just read everything he, he could, I think, when he was younger. And then he would, he would lecture from that. And he was the only professor I had who could really make sense of Aristotle, <laughs> was this guy who was not at all an academic. But he could really teach, you know, very profound principles. And he did a lot of the Ealing studio comedies, the ones with Alec Guinness, Man in the White Suit. Uh, High Wind in Jamaica was later, actually. Uh, but Man in the White Suit, um, The Lady Killers. Uh, and then his first American movie was Sweet Smell of Success, which was hugely influential on directors in the United States. But he truly hated the deal making of Hollywood. He thought it was bad in England, but he realized he was very lucky in England. And when he got to Hollywood, he uh, he got he he didn't really he thought you had to be a deal maker and not director in Hollywood. And so he wasn't sure what to do. And they invited him to be dean of the the first dean of the film school at Cal Arts, and he became a legendary teacher. Yeah. I don't think I would have become a writer if I didn't write a few short scenes there that felt good. And uh, so that sort of got me into writing. I backed into everything I did. I, direct, I began directing at the end of my undergraduate work because I fell in love with Frank Vatican's expre German Expressionist plays. He was a big influence on Brecht, and then unless I directed one. So I became a director <laughs> and then when I got out of Cal Arts, there were no jobs. The schools weren't really connected to theaters. So I became a producer and joined a friend in San Diego. And we started a theater there in 1976. You know, you know what's so fascinating is that. So by then, I then I produced. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what's so fascinating about the Sweet Smell of Success is that. Oh, I produced for 20 years. What's so fascinating about the sweet smell of success, though, is that what's so fascinating about the sweet smell of success, the film, is that yeah. the the um, yeah the people that made it um, had an insight into like you know all these like kind of dirty double dealings, right? But the fact of the matter was what they were yeah. producing was so very true that it was that world that crushed them both. I mean, like you think about M Mendrick didn't want to live in the world he presented so well. Because I mean, like, you know, from what you're describing, yes. you, didn't want to live, you didn't want to live in that world, right? Um, and Odette, similarly, you know, he wrote that because... Yeah. He was, he, 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 now, and I only realized recently that Ernst Lehman apprenticed with a press agent, so he grew up in that world, too. And <laughs> so they all, they all knew it intimately. The cre you know, that McKendrick was an imagination and here's a man and who was really a socialist but he brought people from j walter thompson to say how do you get your ideas across how do you create ideas how do you use your imagination how do you make your ideas persuasive i mean he was not a he he would grab whatever tool he could you know uh, to make a point and to uh, and to create structures dramatic plot structures that revealed characters in action and that would reveal thinking and themes and thoughts but they all came out of almost fairy tale structures about once upon a time in this place there was this guy who wanted to do this but then this guy didn't want that and then the conflict and then suddenly everybody's surprised something happened i mean they actually teach a kind of fairy tale structure that uh was i mean he would grab any kinds of structures he was very eclectic in the way he grabbed structural ideas but storyboarding cartooning was the beginning of a lot of it for me. yeah so i, I want to drawing talk about some of these like, images these early plays and early things you came in contact with, even before uh working with mckendrick um 
you know, you, you mentioned six characters in search of a, a of a play, right? So how has how does that kind of like experimental theater? Yeah, search of an author. author yeah, uh, six six characters in search of an author. So how did that? You know, like you know, for those who are not familiar, that's a play about these character these these characters who arrive the first day of a, or a, a play. You know, the the, pra the uh, uh, practice, and they say, "Oh, we're in search of an author," right? Um, so how is that kind of like that early right. exposure to experimental theater? How did that end up like influencing what you thought was possible in the world of, of writing, and particularly plays? Well, I was very lucky. Uh, it was a very strong literature program where we took about six quarters of dramatic literature, you know, Greeks and the Romans, medieval Renaissance, uh, uh, German classical theater, French classical, uh, the modern playwrights, then American theater, and then dramatic theory and criticism. And then two quarters, actually, you had to, if you were in the theater department at that time, you had to take two quarters of Shakespeare from the English department. And I ended up taking three Shakespeare classes. One was from an anthropologist, uh, or well, a guy who had an anthropological orientation to it and a ritualistic approach to Shakespeare. What the, the training I had at Santa Barbara, and there were some experimental theater people there too, from like Yugoslavia and uh, the company theater, Steve Kent from the company theater came in, uh, uh, which uh, a lot of people in LA had worked with Steve Kent, who passed away a few years ago. He had the James Joyce Liquid Theater and he produced <laughs> a show there. Uh, so it was kind of, there was, and then they would bring in La Mama and ETC, and they'd bring in Holy, Jose Limon's dance company. So there was a huge, you know, and I was a grad student, but the last shows that Joe Chaikin did of the open theater, sort of legendary experimental productions, the last performances were at Santa Barbara. So I went back to see those shows at Santa Barbara, which were the last shows they performed. So it, it kind of... theater i don't think i would have transferred into theater if i didn't know that it was a place where you could use ideas that ideas and philosophy and history were integral part of theater in most other countries other than the usa and there was a great american theater course there that was taught by an ex-marine who was really would teach without notes but he said the american theater was always a commercial theater there was no court subsidy. And so for good or bad, it was driven by commercial instincts. Uh, and then around Eugene O'Neill in the 20th century, there became this experimental theater, but it's always been trying to find its place in the American theater scene. And there've been other people, Robert Brewstein, who wrote the Theater of Revolt, wrote some scathing essays about Broadway. Mm -hmm. And the first chapters of the playwright and thinker were pretty interesting studies of Broadway. And, and that was a time where Broadway was doing more interesting stuff than it did for many decades. Lately, there are some signs that New York, well, now it's shut down. But lately, there are signs that Broadway's doing uh, more interesting things. What the Constitution means to me actually played in a Broadway house under a Broadway contract, not an off-Broadway contract. So there's some interesting signs that it was up, and now it's all shut down completely. Yeah, um, but uh, but the training I had there that everything is game for theater. It gave me a certain confidence that you could tackle big things. Right. So you know, a lot a lot of the a lot of the the plays that were coming out of Eastern Eastern Europe around the, around that time, very like um, or a lot of like art in general was coming out of like the 20th century out of Eastern Europe. Um, a lot of it was is very kind of I don't want to say absurd. I mean, yeah, a lot. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a strong. Uh, satirical absurdist tradition you think about like uh tom stoppard or you think about like um the filmmaker uh, amir costa rica you know like underground thing like that and, like from yugoslavia and uh stoppard from czechoslovakia so i mean like there's a kind of like that 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 kind of like um the kind of like absurdist kind of whimsical you know kind of thing um you know so was that was that did you have playwrights like that coming out of yugoslavia like they very had like that, 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 that come out of that kind of tradition or what, what were they what were yeah they? when i read when i 
Yeah, the absurdists had a big influence on me. I mean, when I, that first quarter, my first English class as a freshman, we read Ian Esco's The Chairs. Mm -hmm. And it was so weird, it struck me as the first realistic play I'd ever read. It was like just as confusing as my life was, you know? And so all the other plays and movies seemed really fake compared to Ionesco, which seemed real. Yeah, that sounds kind of, so uh, I want to continue um, talking about, oh, you froze. So I don't know if the, the screen is frozen on everyone else's screen, but it's frozen on mine. So we're going to wait for Doug to rejoin us. Um, there you go, I think. Yeah, yeah, we, we froze for a second there. Okay, so, so go on. You were talking about Inesco? Inesco? There we go. Hey, hey, Hello. we're back. <laughs> I think, I hope. Is it my uh, I've closed some things okay, yeah. that may uh, help. I, I think we're good. Um, so, yeah, so, so go on. You were talking about uh, work of uh, Ionesco or? I'm probably, I know I'm butchering that. Name. Yeah, can yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can't, you can't hear, hear me you. at all. Can you hear me? Oh man. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna give this one or two more tries. Otherwise, we're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to uh, do a part two with uh, with uh, Doug. Doug, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, he's gone. All right, so we're gonna wait for Doug to come back. If not, we're going to uh, we'll go do a do part two. Martin, don't worry. Oh, we I'll say Martin, don't worry. We're gonna have to get your question. Doug, you back? Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. I'm back. All right, so you were talking about the work of a particular uh, playwright. Uh, well, I was talking about. All right. Hello, I can't hear you, Doug. Uh, I can I can hear you, but I think there may be a delay. There you are. I there see you. Okay, all right, we're back in business. All right. So now your voice has disappeared. I'm here. I'm here. Now I'm hearing my own voice. All right, we got. I hear my own voice now. So we got it. We got a delay. <laughs> all right. Um, Maybe all right, I should use want a. An earbud. All right, well, let's try that. Or if something not, instead of the speaker. Yeah, if not, then we'll, we'll, Are you there? We'll, we'll try. I'm here. I'm let's hearing my own voice on a dog. So, uh. Can you hear me? Okay, I think it's working now. I think it's okay. So let, we got a question from the audience. Let's, let's go to the question from the audience. Uh, it, he's talking about Brecht, and he says, uh, Martin Zier asks, it's my understanding that Brecht's philosophy of the theater was agit theater, where the theater audience in Weimar Germany is as engaged as a participant. Almost, I think of Les Mis as a more projecting than engaging. Do I have a proper read on Brecht and Les Mis? Can you give examples of how Brecht mobilized an audience? Uh, I didn't hear any of that. That was all garbled. <laughs> and I'm hearing my voice. 
coming back at me. All right, all right. A couple of seconds later. What we're going to do is we're going to copy and paste. We're going to copy Martin's question. So I'm going to copy Martin's question so it's not lost. And we're going to have a, a part two with Doug Jacobs since this is like clearly not the technology of the day. So thank you everyone for joining us. Doug, I'm going to I'm gonna reach out to you with Zoom right now and we'll figure this out. Okay. So stay tuned. All right. Doug, part two. So you'll send me